Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing today? I'm glad to have you all here. My name is Reese. I am a senior sociology major, and I got the juice. I was told I'm supposed to say this at every opportunity I have and let everybody know I got the juice. I do not have the juice today. I am here with the great pleasure of introducing you a wonderful speaker by the name of Kevin Powell. He's going to be giving you a lot of great information today, hopefully talking about some of the issues that impact you most deeply. However, I got to give some remarks about myself because, you know, I'm so arrogant and I love myself so much. But no, um, more than anything, I want to thank the university for giving me this opportunity. This has been a very eventful spring. You may be seeing me around a lot, but I would say that you wouldn't be seeing me as much if it weren't for the hard work that myself and a lot of my peers have been doing throughout the fall. So this is a blessing, but this is also a testament to commitment. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I was brought to you to introduce you to this great speaker, and I imagine just like our president, he is a man that does not meet the introduction. However, they wrote for me a great script of all the things that he's accomplished and continues to work for, which I'm be reading later. So why am I in this place? Well, I'm here because I believe diversity and inclusivity operate as both a state of mind, as a way of life, and finally as a process. I am here to let it be known that in the wake of disagreement and in controversy, that students will not be denied, and that our agency will carry us into uncharted territory. I'm here to say that the great dialogues being held in these venues and in other locations, such as the Mosaic Retreat in Diversity and Inclusivity, that the Black Men Initiative, Community Roots, and other organizations I'm proud to be a part of will continue to have these spaces. Please seek them out. We want to hear your voices. And they're not just to be known, but they're to be supported by all of us. To inform you that, well, all the money in the world could not get closed minds to become open or make cold hearts become warm. That is something that only people can do. So I strive for you to be excellent. I'm here to stunt in my lavish clothes. Yeah, go ahead and snap. <laughs> to remind everyone that I am single. <laughs> to try to win you over with my winning smile and yet to let you know that I will not count a single victory until all the communities that I care about feel safe to pursue their excellence without fear of prosecution or ignorance towards their transgressions, and that I will not accept any ties, and that at this point, I have nothing to lose. So with that, I say thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna be very brief. I'm gonna introduce our great President Lowe, who's gonna come up and give some remarks. So please, President Lowe. Good afternoon, Maryland. This is a great day. Thank you all for coming to this signature event of Maryland Dialogues on Diversity and Community. And uh, Reese, I must say, we will miss you when you graduate in two months. He's been an incredible student, a McNair scholar, and you should know, because he's too modest to say these things, but he has a full right for graduate school to get a PhD in sociology. So Reese, in four to five years, I expect to see you here as an assistant professor of sociology. The events of the past year, year and a half. Events that have, uh, that involve some very difficult and uncomfortable truths about our country. Events across the country in Ferguson, Baltimore, Charleston, Black Lives Matter movement across the country. Events on this campus about an appallingly racist, sexist, and misogynist email that circulated, about changing the name of the stadium. All of these issues have led us to begin a series of dialogues, of conversations about diversity and community as in common unity, as in inclusiveness. We as a nation and as a university have made enormous progress in the past decades in diversity, and there is much more progress that we need to do. 
but where we have fallen short is on inclusiveness. Because it's not just about demographics. It's also about mutual respect, tolerance, a safe space where people can speak freely and grow. It's about not just diversity, it's about inclusivity. And so it is that we have the Maryland Dialogues on diversity and inclusivity. How many of you were at the play Baltimore? Quite a few, 20%. 20%. It was a powerful play. And the two things that I remember, number one, when they were talking about their experiences as students at this college, one of them said, it is emotionally exhausting to have these conversations. Yes, it is emotionally exhausting, but we need to have them. And then at the end, if you remember that scene, this resident assistant who has been having all these difficulties with other students, it concludes with her saying something to the effect that I, knew t I need to listen more. Conversations and dialogues is not just about talking, it is about listening, and these are difficult conversations. They are truly emotionally exhausting. So therefore, I think it's appropriate to help us continue our conversation, to continue listening, is to hear from someone who I think is one of the biggest, the boldest, the brightest, the most eloquent, the most passionate writer, poet, and cultural critic of our times, these times of post-civil rights America. He is, of course, our speaker, uh, Mr. Powell, who, by the way, I'm pleased to say that he allowed me to honor him as an honorary terp for today. He's wearing one of those turtle pins. He will be introduced by Reese Hall, but let me just say this. We're here to listen. And a block from here, we still hear the words of Frederick Douglass. Because inscribed at the base of that statue are some of his soaring passages, one of which is my favorite when he says, education means emancipation. And I'm sure he meant not just emanc liberation from actual shackles, but liberation of the mind and of the spirit. And 250 years later, we have Kevin Powell here at the University of Maryland. And there will be copies of his books that will be available afterwards, but it is a searing memoir of his journey to manhood. But it is also ultimately an uplifting story. It is a story of the redemptive power of education. It is a story about the will to live. It is a personal story about a soul that healed. We are very honored to have with us Mr. Powell, and to introduce him formally, here is Reese Hall again. Can't believe my bottle up here, I need that. My mic is hot tonight, so excuse me if there's echoes up here because I'm on two mics because I got so much juice. But nonetheless, let us get to this because I think this is of utmost importance. I need you to listen to this, please. We have a great speaker in the house today. There's a lot of things about Mr. Kevin Powell, but just a synopsis of some of the things that he's worked on in his life and continue to do so. Kevin Powell is an acclaimed community activist and award-winning writer. He was born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey the product of a single mother-led household, extreme poverty, fatherlessness, and violence. In spite of these harsh circumstances, 
Powell studied at Rutgers University in New Jersey and has become a prolific and respected writer. As an activist, Powell has worked on a range of concerns, including voter registration, Hurricane Katrina relief, education, the environment, eradicating poverty, and supply and resource support for post-earthquake Haiti. Kevin is the author of 12, of 12 books, including his newest title, The Education of Kevin Powell, A Boy's Journey into Manhood. It is a critically acclaimed and brutally honest memoir about his life, including his youth. In 2018, he will publish a biography of Tupac Shakur, the late rapper and American icon. Additionally, Powell's writings have appeared in a range of publications that include the very own Washington Post, Newsweek, Essence, Ebony, Esquire, Rolling Stone, and Vibe. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Powell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you all doing? All right. Hey. All right. You, you're alive. That's right. I am um, very honored to be here, be back at the University of Maryland College Park. I actually w used to want to go here badly, um, but I, I was able to afford Rutgers University because I was from New Jersey. But I've, vis I've visited this campus many times. I'm just really deeply honored to be here. I want to thank God for this opportunity. Um, this is not a religious speech. Let me make that clear. Um, and so if people are Christian, if you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, if you're some other faith, even if you're agnostic or atheistic, you have that right. I just hope that we all can agree that we're sisters and brothers. Can we agree to that? I'm with that. We're sisters and brothers. And I do think that we need something spiritual to connect us. As I was listening to your president, uh, Dr. Lowe, speak, and, and thank you. Thank you, Brother Reese. Thank you, uh, University of Maryland College Park. Uh, all of you, you know, thank you so much for having me here. This is a great, great, great uh, honor, faculty, staff, community members. Uh, doctor, you were right. We are in some very profound times. And I was reading this, Embrace Respect, Rise Above, and we're looking at all the isms here. Uh, obviously, today is International Women's Day. We all know that. I know the women know that. And um, wow, where do I even start? The first feminist, the first womanist I ever met in my life was my mother. My mother has an eighth grade education, uh, never went to high school, never set foot on a college campus until the day she dropped me off at Rutgers University, never came back. My mother doesn't read a lot of books. She reads the Bible. She reads the local newspapers. She knows what's going on because she stays on top of the news all the time. Um, but when I think about International Women's Day, I think about women like my mother who has, she had to suffer through racism, and sexism and classism, being a poor per woman of color on this planet. But I would not be standing here if it wasn't for my mother. Literally, she gave her life, and she's still alive, but she sacrificed her own life so that I could have life. So I don't take for granted. I've met a few folks who are, uh, including Sister Angel, who said, you're getting a PhD in women's studies. Is that right? Yeah. You know, and I think that every man here, and there's a few men out there, every one of us, especially if you're an undergrad, do not make the mistake that I made when I was at Rutgers University, which had one, a great women's studies program, not to take a single course in women's studies, not to take seriously Women's History Month in March, not to take seriously Sexual Assault Awareness Month in April, or Domestic Violence Awareness Month in October. You know, when we talk about ignorance and fear and hatred, gentlemen out there, it comes for a lot of us not even knowing and realizing, and if it even is pointed out to us, that just like with many of us have been miseducated around racism, which I'm going to get into, every single one of us is a sexist, patriarchal, misogynist, and it comes from our school system, public or private. It comes from the mass media culture. It comes from our religious institutions. It comes from every angle. Uh, I'm working with a sister, a woman in New York right now, on a piece called She, a multimedia suite, dance and music, on sexual violence, Sandra Bland, y'all know who Sandra Bland was, right? And healing. And she has a wide range of women in this play. Latino sisters, Asian sisters, Native American sisters, uh, African American sisters, white sisters. And every single one of them in that play is deeply affected by the stories of violence. And quite a few of them have been the victims of violence. One of the things I talk about in my book that's been mentioned is my own journey. There's a reason why it's called a, a boy's journey into manhood, because I grew up in that destructive definition of manhood. Are y'all with me out there? 
I'm going to get to race, but because it's International Women's Day, I just had to say that because I know I'm at a school that has some powerful women on this campus, some very powerful women on this campus. And so I just want to thank you all again because uh, none of us would be here if it wasn't for women and girls. And women and girls are our equals, are our equals, are our equals, are our equals, are our equals. And we need to treat them and relate to them and respect them and honor them as our equals. Are you all with me? So, race, that topic. In two weeks, I'm publishing an essay in the Utney Reader, U-T-N-E, the Utney Reader. It just came back to the newsstands. It's in Barnes and Nobles all around the country. It's on college campuses. It'll be on the website. I was approached by the editor of the publication. He said, you know, this is a white brother, a white ally. Because I really do believe that we're all sisters and brothers. You know, and I got that from Sonia Sanchez, the great poet. I first time I heard her say, my white sisters and brothers, my Latino sisters and brothers. I was like, why is she calling everybody her sisters and brothers? She said, we got to claim the world that we want to see. Right? And so this white brother asked me if I wanted to write an essay about race and racism in America. And y'all don't know about it, because we haven't even publicized it yet. We're coming up with a plan. And I was struggling with it, struggling with this essay. This is the cover of Utney Reader. It's not out yet. I just got a box of these last night, mailed to me. On the cover, it says, when will I stop being a blank Kevin Powell on being black in post-Obama America? Y'all can fill in the blank however you like. But when you turn, in the, turn into the inside of the magazine to page 45, and I don't use this word publicly, however, when I said I was struggling with writing this essay about race in America, three in the morning, two in the morning, words just came to me. Anyone who's a writer, anyone out there, an artist, a creative person, y'all know what I'm talking about. You don't even know when the inspiration is going to come. And the words just spoke to me. Will racism ever end? And will I ever stop being an N-I-G-G-E-R? I don't use this word publicly. Now, do I use it properly? Have I? Oh, yeah. Am I a hip-hop head? Oh, yeah, for life. Did I, did I grow up with Richard Pryor? Oh, yeah. And Eddie Murphy? Oh, yeah. And Chris Rock is a peer of mine from Brooklyn? Oh, yeah. But I don't use this word publicly because one of my friends, Jabari Asim, who's the editor-in-chief of the Crisis Magazine, the magazine for the NAACP, who used to be an editor and a writer at the Washington Post, wrote a book a few years back called The N-Word, The History of the N-Word. Because his point was like, people use this word, I don't even know where the word came from. But as I was thinking about writing this essay or having this conversation, doctor, on race and racism, I said, you know what, let's just ask the question, will racism ever end and will I ever stop being an N-I-G-G-E-R? But the first line in the essay is, I am not an N-I-G-G-E-R, I am not uh, N-I-G-G-A, I am not a N-I-G-G-U-H. You know, we like to say, well, I don't really mean it like that, brother. Well, the A means you my homie. If it's E-R, it means something else. And because I grew up in the era of straight out of Compton, I even threw in there, I'm not your N-I-G-G-U-Z for life either. <laughs> Y'all feel me? And this is the hardest essay I've ever written in my life on race and racism in America. It was supposed to be 1,500 words. And I said to my editor, can I get a few more words? He said, let's take it to 2,500. I get to 2,500, I said to my editor, I got to keep going. It's now 3,200 words. By the time it was over, 7,000 words spilled out of me. Because I said, I can't just talk about Baltimore, Maryland, which we're going to talk about here. I can't just talk about Ferguson, where I was, and went right to the spot where Michael Brown had been killed. I can't talk about New York, where I come from, be it Amadou Diallo or Eric Garner getting chokehold to death. I can't just talk about Sandra Bland. We still don't know what happened. Am I right, y'all? You know, I said, I need to talk about the whole history here. Where did this thing come from? You know, why, did we, why are we still dealing with this in 2016? Are y'all with me out there? Why are we even having conversations about naming a football stadium at the University of Maryland in 2016? Or why are we still calling a football team 
a derogatory term for Native Americans just down the road. So I wrote this essay. And, you know, Dr. Lowe, you said something. And I was writing this essay. This ain't, even, this ain't even in my notes at this point. I cried writing this essay. I cried because I'm in my 40s now. My introduction to racism is when I went to a school just like the University of Maryland, Rutgers University. I cried because when I got on that campus, there was this word called apartheid floating all over the place. And I didn't know what apartheid was. I didn't know what South Africa was. I had never heard of Nelson Mandela or Winnie Mandela. I was a straight A student, K through 12. I knew nothing about Africa, knew nothing about the West Indies, knew nothing about black American history. In fact, during my school years, K through 12, 13 years of school, black history totaled about two pages. Dr. Green, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Some man named George Washington Carver messed around with some peanuts. I was like, what? <laughs> All right, peanuts, I got it. And Jack Jackie Robinson integrated baseball. And that was the totality, that was the totality of my education about black people. And then for good measure, since it is Women's History Month, we just mentioned uh, International Women's Day. Same thing with women. I think y'all might have been a page. <laughs> Betsy Ross sold a flag, right? Florence Nightingale, right? Helen Keller, we didn't even know how dope she was. <laughs> All we were like, she's blind and she's deaf. I, I, years later, I started reading my Helen Keller. I was like, she's amazing. This woman was a humanitarian. Rosa Parks served double duty. And that was the contributions of women and girls to this country and to this world. Now we're laughing about it, but the tragedy is when you see, as Eve Insler has told us, one out of three women on, in, 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 on the planet, over a billion women, the victims of some form of sexual violence in their lifetimes at the hands of us men. The tragedy is when an Eric Garner, a grown black man, is just trying to sell some loose cigarettes to feed his family in New York. And I live in, I've lived in New York half my life. The other half is in New Jersey, where I was born and raised. I know how expensive it is to live in New, Jer New York City. I know that people got to have a hustle and so sometimes people are going to sell some loose cigarettes. I don't know how loose cigarettes translates into you being chokehold to death and screaming out, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Unless the people choking you to death, whether they're a white cop or a black cop, Freddie Gray, Baltimore, or a Latino cop or an Asian cop, their mindset has been so contaminated with this thing called racism that they don't value the life of this person saying, I can't breathe. Are y'all with me out there? Wow. So I'm writing this essay for Utney Reader. Will racism ever end? And I'm crying because I have to recount things that I have went through writing my book. That memoir that's out there took me four or five years to, to write. Because I realized I can't just write a book about myself. This book is as much about my mama and her family, and my grandparents, and my great-grandfather, Benjamin Powell, who in the early 1900s in South Carolina, the low country of South Carolina, was just doing what black folks were told they should do coming out of the Civil War and out of slavery. Two things, get an education, own some land. My great-grandfather owned 400 acres of land in the low country of South Carolina, right by Savannah, Georgia. And he was a cook, a chef in the community. As I describe in this essay, and as I say in the book, the white brothers in that community, the racist, the minted ones, the ones who had the Donald Trump mentality, or the Ted Cruz mentality, or the Chris Christie mentality, or the Rudy Giuliani mentality, which is about hatred and fear and division and violence, decided one day to knock on my great grandmother's door and say, your husband, you know what? He choked on his own food, and he somehow found his way into some water. He's dead. They killed him. And then they proceeded to say to my great-grandmother, we're going to give you one penny for 397 of those 400 acres of land. You can keep three acres for yourself. 
but we're going to take the rest of it for one penny each. That was it. There was no justice. There was nothing. And as I say in that essay, some people say, well, what does that have to do with me? I didn't own slaves. I didn't do that to your great-grandfather. I didn't destroy the black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Wilmington, North Carolina, and many other communities. I'm not gentrifying Southeast DC. You know, what does it have to do with you is if you see these things going on and you say nothing about it, you become just as guilty. It's just like when I give speeches about sexism to men. Men will say, well, I didn't curse out the woman. I didn't grab her in a party. You know, I didn't sexually assault her. I didn't rape her. I didn't kill her. And my response is, fellas, even if you're not the kind of man who's done any of those things, but you see it happening all around you, and you say nothing about it, you become just as guilty. Racism. I'm watching the debates. Y'all been watching the debates? <laughs> I mean, I'm a vegan these days, right? I stopped at New Vegan down the street before I got here. The food was good, too. I hope to go back after this program. <laughs> but for the Republican debate, I said, let me get my vegan popcorn out. Right? And I'm looking at this, and I'm talking to some of my, 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 I hate to say it like this, but some of my white friends. And I said, man, but let's be real. Let's have an honest conversation. I'm talking to some of my white friends, my white sisters and brothers. And I said, you know, they're saying to me, Kev, it ain't what people think. It ain't just ignorant, quote unquote, white folks that's supporting Donald Trump. It's all kinds of white folks that are supporting Donald Trump, and the racism, and the sexism, and the xenophobia, all of it. And you got to understand that Donald Trump symbolically represents the worst of this country's history. Yeah, he does. You know, some of us who are from New York remember that when the, these five young black and Latino males were picked up and said to have raped a white woman in Central Park without any evidence and spent years in jail, and eventually found innocent because someone eventually admitted that he did it, their lives were destroyed. Guess who took out an ad in the newspapers in New York and called these young men monsters and thugs? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. You know what I mean? And so I'm watching these debates, and I don't care if you're liberal or, or conservative, Democrat or Republican, the question I ask people, where is your humanity where your only way of having, being a politician is to just blame and scapegoat people? And if we are ignorant, sisters and brothers, students here, if you don't read, if you don't study, if you don't read, you don't study, you, be, you don't realize that Latino immigrants or Muslims or Arab people today used to be Jewish people, used to be Japanese people, used to be Italian people, used to be Irish people, used to be African American people, still is, used to be Native American, still is. Y'all feel what I'm saying here? You know what I mean? That cannot become the politics of this country. But it is. Do yourselves a favor. Go to YouTube and watch Barry Goldwater speaking in 1964. And ask yourself, what is the difference between Barry Goldwater speaking in 1964 or George Wallace speaking in 1964 or 68 or 72 before he was shot down by the attempted assassin's bullet? And what's the difference between that and what Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio have been saying? It's racism. But it ain't just them. I'm watching a Democratic debate on Sunday. It's in Flint, Michigan. And you know, some of us who are activists know that there's been something wrong in our communities for a long time. When I was in college, I went to school with a, a woman named Lisa Williamson. She's a couple years older than me. Y'all know her as Sister Soldier. At a certain point, Sister Soldier actually had a job in New York City with the United Church of Christ slash the Commission for Racial Justice. There was an Asian American brother who did a report, a study, that he eventually coined the term environmental racism. Well, what was that report about? His report was like, why is it that in poor communities, black, white, Latino, Asian, Native American, and poor white communities, are, is there lead in the water, why are people getting cancer at a disproportionate rate? 
Why do all these kids in places like Baltimore, Brooklyn, New York, where I'm from, why do they have asthma? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And fast forward to Flint, Michigan, these people are suffering. Whoever becomes the nominees for both parties will raise at least a billion dollars this year, each. Meanwhile, people in Flint, Michigan, in places like it, can't even have decent, clean water. Are y'all with me out there? That's called racism and classism, because these are poor people. You know what I mean? And Don Lemon, who I don't always agree with, asked the question, you know, what are your racial blind spots, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders? I don't care who y'all supporting, it's your business. But I will say this to y'all. I lived through the Clinton years, the Reagan Bush years, and it's interesting to me that when Mr. Clinton was the President of the United States, more black men went to jail than did the Reagan Bush years. When Mr. Clinton was the President of the United States, we're talking about racism here, but let's be honest about it. My mother, who raised me on welfare, food stamps, government cheese, under the kind of poverty I wouldn't wish for anybody, if I was a child in the 1990s and she was a single mother in the 1990s, I was already gone out of the house by that time, she would have been one of the folks who would have been the victim of welfare reform during the Clinton years. Are you with me out there? Hillary didn't mention that. Other people mentioned it, but it's conveniently left out. That's called racism. I'll support you if you're going to be honest about who you are. You can't, your response can't be what she said over and over again on Sunday. Well, that's back in the 90s. If you want to go back to the 90s, well, we have to go back to the source of things. Because you know, it's like Malcolm X said. History is a people's memory, and without it, you're demoted to the lower animals. In other words, you better know where people are coming from. Now, folks are talking about Bernie Sanders. Black folks here are supporting Hillary blindly, in my opinion. And I want to see a woman president. I absolutely want to see a woman president. But I also have to ask some hard questions. What are you going to do about mass incarceration of my community that started and accelerated under your husband? What are you going to do about poverty that accelerated at times in your husband's years. You can't tell me that the society was doing so well we, we, when he left office, there was this huge surplus. The question becomes, surplus for who? I live in New York City. Have y'all been to Brooklyn lately? And I'm not talking downtown Brooklyn with a state, the new arenas there. I'm talking about in the community. If everything is so well, why did Baltimore explode last year? Why is it when I travel around the country, and I've been to all 50 states in this country, every major city, why does every city look exactly the same way if everything is so well? If there was this great surplus at the end of the 90s? Boo! But then I'm going to go over to Bernie, because everyone's like, he's so progressive. I'm listening to his response about his blind spots, and I'm saying to myself, sir, with all due respect, as someone who comes from what we call the ghetto, all black folks ain't from the ghetto. All black folks are not poor. And even those of us who are from the ghetto or are poor the way I was, guess what, sir? I was an A student. Guess what, sir? I love Shakespeare. Guess what, sir? I also love math. That's why I graduated the math award when I graduated from high school. Guess what, sir? We're whole complex human beings. You cannot reduce people to just being from the ghetto or poor. And that's the totality of your experience with black people. And then you wonder why they ain't giving you the vote. So it doesn't matter how progressive you claim to be. Do you even know me? Do you know me? Are y'all with me out there? Do you know who I am? And so when we talk about race and racism, my thing is question everything. Freddie Gray, anyone from Baltimore out there? Where do you start? Where do you start? Where do you start? One of the things I say in this essay, one of the things I say in this essay, and this is me on the cover with a hood on my head. One of the things I say in this essay, to your point, Dr. Lowe, it is exhausting to be a black person or a person of color in America. Women, isn't it exhausting to be a woman in this country? And on this planet, you know? Because when you have privilege, be it skin privilege, or gender privilege, or class privilege, 
or ability versus disability privilege, right? Or sexual identity privilege, am I right, y'all? My lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, sisters and brothers, y'all know what I'm talking about. When you have any kind of privilege, you don't have to think about anything. But as I say in this essay, man, I'm a runner. I've run the last two New York City marathons. I was in California last, uh, last month, and I wanted to go run some miles. I woke up early. I literally had to sit there and watch the clock click minute after minute after minute until the sun came out because I was so conscious that I didn't want to go outside and run because of the climate in this country because I don't want someone saying that, who's that black man running around here? Or someone saying, I'm going to become George Zimmerman, I'm going to shoot him. Y'all with me? Or well, last two weeks ago, I'm in Florida, driving from Florida State University down to Bethune-Cookman University, a historically black college named after Mary McLeod Bethune. Y'all should know who she is, Mary McLeod Bethune. Four hour drive, I get stopped by the police. Now to be fair, I was speeding, I will be honest with that. I was driving mad fast, son, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Why lie? I was trying to get there. But when I got pulled over, because I'm thinking about Sandra Bland. I'm thinking about Sandra Bland. I'm thinking about that videotape of her and that interaction with the cop. How I'm like that cigarette she's puffing on, pulling, dragging on real hard. And thinking to myself, all right, let me text my assistant. Here I am on the this, on this Florida State Highway. I've just been pulled over by a state trooper. If anything happens, this is what happened. Who has to think like that? Who has to tell their children, this is what happens to you if you get stopped by the police? This is how you got to conduct yourself. Who has to think like that? You know? Freddie Gay, Freddie Gray, I mean, how do you get your body broken in half? How do you get your neck, your body snapped, yo? And you just dead. You dead. I mean, the question becomes, doctor, like how many of these conversations we gotta have before anything actually changes? You know? How many people in Flint, Michigan gotta keep complaining about their water? What's gonna happen to my children? What's gonna happen to my children, yo? And what's, what's, what's clear to me, sisters and brothers, is that a lot of us, <laughs> a lot of us, we call ourselves Americans. Don't even know anything about America. Don't know the history. Don't want to know the history. We keep saying this in the past. But when you don't deal with the history, you're doomed to repeat it over and over again. Yeah, you are. As I say in that essay, we've had three opportunities, in my humble opinion, to have this conversation on race and racism. And I hope this is a fourth opportunity where we are in America right now. The first opportunity after Native Americans were the victims of genocide, which they were. Native Americans were the victims of genocide. Please think about that when you celebrate Thanksgiving this year. Nothing wrong with supporting the Washington football team, but be like my friend Jessica Pinckney, who's from this area, the DMV, and say the Washington team. Don't call them by that nickname. Because how would you feel if a, if a derogatory term for Jewish people, or African Americans, or Italians, or Irish people, or Polish people was the nickname for sports teams all over this country? How would you feel? The Redskins, the Indians, the Braves, the Seminoles. It's offensive because they were the victims of genocide. And as we were growing up, we were told to play cowboys and Indians. We were told that the Indians were so dumb that they sold Manhattan Island for some trinkets. What was it, $26? I mean, think about the lies, the mythologies. We're told that Columbus discovered America. Well, if you look at the definition for terrorism on the United States government website, look it up for yourself, you realize, wait a minute, that's what Columbus was because he terrorized people. And the other explorers terrorized people. They were already here. They were like, let's share, but someone had greed in them, they had power in them, they had privilege in them, they had racism in them. Genocide. But we're not gonna stop there. We got these people who are hardworking, we're gonna call them Africans, for lack of a better term. We're gonna kidnap them from Africa and we're gonna bring them to this part of the world, and we're gonna make them work for free, and they're gonna build the economic infrastructure for this country. Where are the financial, where are the economic majors at out there? Where are the financial majors out there? Where are the business majors out there? Where are y'all at? 
How many of y'all have had conversations about global economies? Raise your hand. The first global economy in the world was called slavery. What else was it? It built the economic infrastructure for this country. It was built on race and power and privilege and fear and hatred and division. Sound familiar? And it went on for centuries. Strip people of their identity, strip people of their heritage, strip people of everything. You know? The Revolutionary War comes along, the founding fathers, quote unquote, said they want to be independent from the British. OK, that's cool. But that independence didn't include poor white people. It didn't include women of any background. It didn't include Native Americans. And it certainly didn't include black folks. And most of the black folks, there were some free black folks. Most of us were slaves. So when you see people like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington saying all men are created equal, they didn't even bother to release their slaves. So they weren't serious. There was a hypocrisy. That was an opportunity to have a conversation about race. If we really believe that all men and women are equals, then why don't we have the audacity to release these people from bondage? That's the first opportunity. Second opportunity is called the Civil War. I'm a student of Dr. King, love Dr. King. I know at the end of his life, Dr. King actually referred to Abraham Lincoln as the great vacillator, not the great emancipator, because sometimes Abraham Lincoln was for slavery, look it up, and sometimes he was against slavery. Your native son of Maryland, Frederick Douglass, you better believe he was pushing people like Abraham Lincoln. You know, he didn't just come to decisions on his own, it was pushing him, Sojourner Truth, International Women's Day, right? Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, International Women's Day, right? You know? These powerful human beings, males and females, women and men. The Civil War happens. The reason why Lincoln passed the Emancipation Proclamation was basically like, we need more soldiers in the Union Army or we're going to lose this war. The South's going to win. But guess what, y'all? The South did win. Look at the state we're in. But when I say South, I mean like Malcolm X. South is south of the Canadian border. It's a mindset. It ain't a region. It ain't a geography. When people diss the South, I'm like, man, I've seen worse things happen in New York City. So what you talking about? I ain't going to diss South Carolina where my people come from. I'm going to diss the whole area where there's just racism and challenge that. But after Lincoln was assassinated and you had the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments ostensibly freeing black folks and the right to vote and citizenship, you had this thing called Reconstruction. Remember Reconstruction, y'all? 1865 to 1877. We're talking about a conversation on race. How can we have a conversation on race if we don't know basic American history? How are you going to have a conversation on race if you don't know basic American history? 1865, 1877, some interesting things happened. People in states like Louisiana and South Carolina, my family's from, were electing black folks to the United States Congress. 1866, Howard University, right down the street, black school is created. Other historical black colleges start popping up, right? Education, land, 40 acres of the mule. We heard all these terms, right? But then the presidential election year rolled around 1876. Rutherford B. Hayes wanted to be President of the United States. The Great Compromise of 1877, so he could get into office. If you let, give me your electoral college votes, sound familiar? We will, I will pull the troops out of the South. Why were those troops there? To make sure there wasn't a form of domestic terrorism happening to black folks, the racism. Those troops are pulled out. 20 some odd years later, my great grandfather gets killed for his 400 acres of land, and God knows how many other people got killed, hung from trees, etc. Are y'all with me out there? We just had this protest around Oscar's so white, but guess what? During that time, from the 1870s up into the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement, 50s and 60s Civil Rights Movement, the Hollywood film industry started. You were talking about Oscar's so white. Well, Hollywood's so white because the movie that kickstarted the whole film industry was called Birth of a Nation, 1915, 100 years ago. Look it up, D.W. Griffith, a racist, a certifiable racist who put out the most destructive images of black people. The third opportunity. Civil rights movement. For the sake of argument, 1954 to 1968, from the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, separate but unequal schools, you know? What happened in 1955, y'all, before Rosa Parks in December with the Montgomery bus boycott with Dr. King, in the summer of that year, a little black boy named Emmett Till, like Tamir Rice in Ohio, gets killed for allegedly whistling at a white sister while visiting Chicago, Mississippi, from his home state of Chicago. Civil rights movement happens. Black folks, white folks coming together. Movement engineered by black folks. 
And let's talk, since it's International Women's Day, Ella Baker, Diane Nash, you know? Let's stop assuming that these were men who were doing all the work. We know if we really study history that the civil rights movement would not have happened if it wasn't for the women there on the front lines. It was an attempt to have that conversation, Dr. Lowe, and the black folks and their white allies go watch a movie called Freedom Summer that came on PBS just a couple of summers ago where you see white students in large numbers from places like the University of Maryland going to the South, Freedom Rise, joining the Student Online Coordinating Committee, sitting in protesting. It was, a, it was simple. Can I vote? Can I vote? And can I be treated like a citizen? Is that asking a lot? Can I vote? And can I be treated like a citizen? Here we are in 2016, almost half the countries in this state, in this, 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 half the states in this country, pardon me, have voter ID laws 50 years after that simple question, can I vote and can I be treated as a citizen? Are y'all with me out there? I talked to elders of the movement, black ones, white ones, Latino ones, Asian ones, they'll say to me, we really thought something significant was happening, that we were changing this country. And I'd be lying to you if I said there has not been some progress since the civil rights era. I'm standing here because of the civil rights movement. I stand on the shoulders of the folks who came before me. I'm a first generation college student. The very program that took me to college, the Educational Opportunity Fund in New Jersey was created out of the civil rights movement. I'm poor. We had no money, but that program was created because people sacrificed their lives. All they wanted was an opportunity to have an opportunity. And then I get to college, and in my first couple weeks of school, I get racially profiled by the campus police. Me and my homeboy from the West End, he's from Trinidad and Tobago. Can we see your IDs? Y'all with me out there? And here, I'm talking about something that happened in the 80s and 90s. I go to these college campuses and students are saying the same thing in the 2000s. It's like every time our country makes a step forward, Barack Obama gets elected president of the United States, a rainbow coalition of people of all backgrounds puts him in office. It was all this goodwill. People started throwing out the term post-racial. I was like, man, they're going to regret using that term. <laughs> but fast forward to the last year of his administration, more death threats than any other president in the United States history. An opposition party saying publicly and loudly, loudly, we are going to obstruct anything he tries to put in place. When have you ever seen an opposition party say to the sitting president of the United States, you are not going to nominate another Supreme Court justice? Where does that exist? You know what I mean? And so racism is race plus power and privilege. Racism is race plus power and privilege. To my white sisters and brothers out there, even if you're not a billionaire like Donald Trump, even if you're not a multimillionaire, just by virtue of the color of your skin in a society where racism is a system, you benefit from it, whether you realize it or not. Read Tim Wise. Read my friend, my homegirl, J. Love Calderon. Study Eve Ensler. Study Gloria Steinem. You know, you don't have to listen to black folks or Latino folks or Asian folks or Native American folks. There are plenty of white writers, right thinkers, white activists out there who have talked about this. You know, one of my heroes, the last four years of his life, you're talking about, well, what do we do? Bobby Kennedy, when he was attorney general, when uh, his brother was the president of the United States, he was considered not the dopest person in the world. He was considered problematic to a lot of folks, not supportive of the civil rights movement. But when his brother Bobby got killed on national TV, his brother John got killed on national TV, Bobby, for the first time, was profoundly traumatized because he and Jack, John Kennedy, were like this. These two wealthy Roman Catholic Irish American brothers. John's gone. And for the first time, John, Bobby started to feel a level of empathy and compassion around suffering because guess what, y'all? He's now suffering. Right? And when he reemerged in 1964, and for the last four years of his life, this wealthy white brother, it didn't matter what kind of privilege and power he had, he understood. What does it matter if you have power or privilege if you don't use it for justice for people who have been the victim of your power and privilege? 
So if you go back and listen to Bobby Kennedy's speeches, he's talking about white supremacy in South Africa in 1966. Look at the speech he gave in Indiana when Dr. King was killed. He's talking about racism. And so every one of us in this room, no matter what your background, if you want to have a conversation on racism, I recommend that the conversation needs to start with yourself. What did I actually learn about America, holistically? What do I know about myself? Who am I? You know, when I got to college as an African person, because I'm an African person, I'm an African person, as a black person, as an African American, and I began to realize, man, I don't know anything about black history, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I'm like, how am I aspiring to be a writer? I never even heard of the Harlem Renaissance or the Black Arts Movement. I don't even know who Langston Hughes is. I had never heard of Malcolm X until I got to college, and not because of college per se, but because of the students, student leaders like Brother Reese, genius that he is, who said, hey, first, first year student, you need to know this stuff. Because how can you love anybody else if you don't even love yourself? How can you love anybody else if you are self-hating? And the way I describe in my memoir, The Education of Kevin Powell, I was so brainwashed. Because that's what racism does to you. It brainwashes you. That's what sexism does to you. It brainwashes you, classism, into an inferiority complex. And it brainwashes someone else into a superiority complex. Y'all with me out there? And so, yeah, we're all sisters and brothers. But one of the things I say in this essay, man, I just want to be treated as a whole human being. I want to be free. I want to be able to riff about Shakespeare. I want to be able to talk about hip hop. Yo, son, did you hear Kendrick Lamar's new album? You know what I mean? You know? I want to be able to talk about the Yankees and Red Sox rivalry. A whole human being. Not be reduced to a N-I-G-G-A or N-I-G-G-E-R, a thug, a gangster. If I happen to be Beyonce at the Super Bowl, and I decide, wait a minute, I'm an artist, and I understand something that Nina Simone said, an artist should reflect her or his times. Guess what? I got a huge platform, the biggest TV show of the year. I'm Beyonce. I've paid my dues. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to navigate this thing. I'm going to dress in black. I'm going to have these singers, the dancers with me dress in black. This happens to be the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party. They were not a terrorist organization. They were an organization trying to empower people in the community. They were started because of racial profiling, police brutality, right? Because I read. I study, I travel, I know my history, and I'm going to come out there and I'm going to recognize, wait a minute, Mario Woods, one of the many victims of police brutality and racial profiling, and then I'm going to get us in a formation like an X, like Malcolm X. Y'all feeling me here? This is all at the Super Bowl, and I'm watching this. I'm saying, hey, you know what? I ain't really been a Beyonce fan on that level, but this is gangster, son, what she just did. <laughs> because she was being subversive. Just the way Nina Simone made a song called Mississippi Goddamn, right? It was subversive. Right? Just like Bob Dylan, a Jewish brother, made a song called Blowing in the Wind, which was so powerful that a black brother named Sam Cooke first recorded the song himself, and then that song by this Jewish brother inspired him to make a song called A Change Is Gonna Come. Are y'all with me out there? That's how you defeat racism. You take a stand. You don't have to come from where I come from, but if you're a Bob Dylan or just Bob anybody and you see all of this going on as a doctor, as a lawyer, as an accountant, as a journalist, as a sports journalist, whatever it is y'all decide to do with your lives, you have to say something because other you're gonna, you got to decide what side of history am I going to be on here? Why do these black students feel like this on this campus? Why do Latino students who might be the children of immigrants constantly looking over their shoulder worried about raids? You have to do something. Have a conversation with yourself. What do I know about America? What do I really know about America? What do I really know about myself? It ain't enough to say, well, I'm black. I'm white. Well, what were you? Where'd you come from? Who are your people? What language did they speak? You know, when I met the president, your president, he said, man, I'm a Chinese man who was born in a Spanish-speaking country called Peru. And when I came to this country, am I right, sir? You said I spoke Chinese and Spanish. No English. And look at, it, look at his journey. And as he was speaking about his background, I thought about a boy in my eighth grade class named Merco Delgado, who was from Peru. You know, and I was fascinated by the fact he was from Peru, because I didn't know where Peru was, you know what I'm saying? And then I thought about how when I got of age in college, and I started learning about, because black folks, you know, the only Chinese person we related to was Bruce Lee in the movies. 
and then the Chinese restaurants in our communities. But when I started studying the history of China, I said, man, one of the greatest civilizations in world history. But then also when I started studying what happened to Chinese American people, Chinese exclusionary laws in places like Oregon, in this country, I'm like, wow, as these folks, Chinese folks are building railroads. Because I read, I study. So I'm saying not only did I have to learn my own history as a black person, but I want to know about these folks. Who are these Italian Americans in Brooklyn? Who are these Russian Americans in Brooklyn? Are y'all with me out there? You know? Who are these people? Teach me as I teach you. Think about what Dr. King said. Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will come together and sing, sing in the words of the Negro spiritual. Will join hands, pardon me, and sing in the words of the Negro spiritual. He was saying, hey, we're all equals here. We're all equals here, even though the system doesn't treat us equally. But if we relate to each other as equals, we can defeat the 1%, including the Donald Trumps and the folks like Ted Cruz and all these other folks who want to keep us divided because of racism, sexism, classism, disableism, homophobia, transphobia, you name it, that pit y'all against each other, that pit us all against each other while they maintain that power. That's what's going on. And I'm saying, man, I don't want to participate in that. What's the solution, y'all? It's called love. It's called love. It's called love. And love means that I love myself. And if I love myself, and my name is Cam Newton, quarterback for the Carolina Panthers, I love who I am. I love what I represent. I love who I am culturally. Don't try to put your cultural value system on me and tell me if I dance a certain way, if I celebrate a certain way, if I speak a certain way, then there's something wrong with me. I must be a thug or I'm arrogant. Why can't I have swagger? Peyton Manning has swagger. Tom Brady has swagger. Why can't I have swagger too? Why can't I be LeBron James, who was born to a single black mother who was a teenager, and decide, wait a minute, I don't just work for you. I'm going to be my own entrepreneur. I'm going to do what I do, what I want to do. But if you put your value system on me because of systemic racism, you will judge every single thing that I do, including saying I want to spend my off day with my homeboy, my good friend, D. Wade. Everything is under scrutiny. Are y'all with me out there? Racism is at every single level. And people will say, people will, the racist will make you feel like you actually are the racist. The racist will make you seem like it ain't really that bad out there. I'm like, that's like telling a woman. The other day I got an email from a woman who said, Kevin, I've been reading your work. I appreciate your honesty as a man. All of, you know, you were violent in your lifetime. I talk very honestly about it. Why lie? 25 years of therapy, y'all, counseling. I'm like, I don't want, I want to be about peace and love. I don't want to be violent toward anybody, right? But she said, I'm in a situation. My, my man cracked two of my ribs. And he's a conscious, socially conscious artist. And he's an artist who performs with a socially conscious star out there. I ain't going to say what genre of music. And she actually had people say to her, ain't it, as bad? it ain't as bad as you think it is. This is what it said to people of color or black folks in this country. It ain't as bad as you think it is. You know? Yeah, we just watched a man get chokehold to death on video. Yeah, we just saw Sandra Bland in a car one minute, and the next thing we know, she's hanging, from a, hanging in a cell. But it ain't as bad as you think it is. Y'all know what I'm saying? That's the insanity of racism. That's the insanity of any form of oppression, injustice, It'll make you feel like there's something wrong with you. And I'm here to tell y'all, there is nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with being angry. You should be angry. In fact, I would say, if you're not angry about racism or sexism or classism or homophobia or transphobia or ableism or any form of injustice, there actually is something wrong with you. It says that you've so repressed your own humanity that you just suffer peacefully. Now, what I do say to people, because I've had to evolve, is the difference between proactive anger and reactionary anger. Proactive anger is, let me take this energy that I feel, and I'm going to become city councilman brother Brandon in Baltimore. Young brother. I met Brandon when he was a college student in one of the schools in Maryland. And I'm going to get my college degree, or my PhD, brother Reese, and I understand this is not just about me and my 12 books, Kevin Powell, but whatever skill set you got, you take it back to some community and you serve those people. Are y'all with me out there? That's what you do with it. You build something. You build an institution, an organization, a business, something that serves people, right? 
You become a bridge builder. That's what proactive anger is about. And it's got to be rooted in love. Can y'all say love? Love. The reactionary anger just destroys. It tears down. And don't get me wrong. I understand why folks rebelled in Baltimore. Because as Dr. King said himself, a riot is the language of the unheard. Right? So I'm not going to come in and judge people because they are tearing stuff up. Guess what? What's worse, them tearing up stuff for a couple of days or what they got to deal with their entire lives? Y'all with me out there? That systemic racism, poverty is the worst kind of violence that I've ever experienced in my life. Because it affects you physically, it affects you spiritually, it affects you mentally. I'm not, ju I'm not con condoning violence, I'm about peace and love. But how can I say I love people? We love people and we don't understand why they are angry. But we gotta move towards love, y'all. And my challenge to y'all out here, especially the students, I say it in the essay, I'm tired of people saying, well, I don't know if it's gonna happen in my lifetime. We gotta make it happen. And we gotta stop putting it on students and young people. Well, it's y'all turn. No, it's actually our turn. Just because you're over 30, over 40, over 50, don't mean it's over. It ain't over till you go on. And our responsibility, if young people at the University of Maryland or any of these campuses around the country are raising critical questions, are, are re, re, reacting to what they see out there, not to condemn or judge them, but like, how can I support you? What can I do to help you? That's what you do. We work together. Because we got to change this country, y'all. We got to change this country. I get interviews from media all around the world, and the first question I get over and over again is, what is wrong with America? What is wrong with America? Why are they killing people like that? And if it ain't police brutality, it's us fighting each other, or it's mass shootings, these vicious attacks on women and girls who I was talking about earlier. Y'all know what I'm talking about. What is going on with us? Where violence is so normalized, when someone gets killed, we, we react for a moment, then we go back to business as usual until the next person gets killed. You know? And so, it's gotta be about love. It's gotta be about love. I have hope. I'm going to close it here. I have hope. God knows I have hope. Because we ain't really got any other choice. What gives me hope is when I look at a young man like a Kendrick Lamar come out on the Grammys in chains, and then he breaks the chains off, and he starts performing, and he's speaking his mind fearlessly. And the song ends with Africa and the word Compton in the middle of that Africa map. I have hope because a white brother that I know and I've become very fond of, named Macklemore, of Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. Been, work, been around them for the last year. I'm writing something about them right now. The signs he's going to put out a song called White Privilege Two. Whether you love the song or hate the song, that's all I could ask from a white ally. Talk about it, man. Challenge people, man. You know? When I started thinking about sexism and what can I do, I remember asking Bell Hooks, a mentor, and, and Eve Ensler, other folks, what do I do as a man? They said, talk about it, man. You know, work with the men, man. What do I do, white sisters and brothers? Work with each other. You can work with us, too. We can be allies. We can be in coalitions. But y'all got to challenge this stuff on this campus. You got to challenge in your, in your classes. If you are studying any major, you never see people of color in, anywhere in the subject matter. How can you be a sociology major or a political science major or a history major or an economics major or a biology major, any major, and there's like no, no, no one of color that did anything? Nothing? I mean, am I wrong? You know what I'm saying? No one? You know? I mean, that's amazing to me. So diversity is not just having a group of people together who are different backgrounds. It's about diversifying your mindset. So even if those people are not there, because you are so in touch with love, self-love, and love of humanity, you raise the question, y'all. Why aren't these people being represented? Why aren't they here? Y'all with me? That's what you do. You got to be that courageous person that have that conversation, even if no one else wants to have that conversation. Even if people say that you're crazy, you got to do it anyway. That's what you got to do. Love. And love is an action. Thank y'all. Thank you. Are we, um...
Thank you. So, thank you. Um, thank you. Does that mean I can get some tickets to the Yankees Orioles game soon? <laughs> Trying to get those free tickets, yeah. We're going to um, do, Mr. Reese, let me shut up. No, excellent work, Mr. Kevin Powell. One more time, real quick, just give thank me a quick hand. May I make one, one quick announcement? Absolutely. Reese is single, just for the record. You can come back here a few times, you know? You can keep making I'll be his publicist. No, I will say, um, first off, excellent speech. Praise I think my, um, my mama told me I wrote a speech like that. That was real good. My niece had helped me. We was going to do it up here, but one, I can't read something that's written in Crayola in front of this audience. And two, I don't want to be another brother that takes credit for the work that a great sister does. So mm. excellent work up here right now. Thank you. I will say this. The hashtag we're going to be using for this following series is going to be hashtag UMD Dialogues. But we're going into a Q&A session. We want you, we got two mics that are stationed at the opposite sides of the room. If you have a question that you would like to ask Mr. Powell that you would like to have answered and addressed today, we ask you to please come on up, or you can use the hashtag that I just used, and you can tweet it out. We're gonna try to get through everything you can. I'm gonna be in the audience trying to help to, like, get y'all to your microphones or perhaps help bring it to you, facilitating questions and whatnot. Please do not be scared in this session. There's a lot of things to talk about. Heard you mention the email later. I'm gonna talk about that. There's a lot of things we could go after here. We ask that you be respectful in this process, but we ask that you try to tiptoe outside your boundaries, crawl outside your boundaries. And, so, and I, I can say it as a speaker, your tuition fees pay for speakers to come here. So you should ask questions, you should push back, you should talk. The best questions I always get is after the program is over. I'm like, that should be a question you ask with everyone hearing this question. So use your voices, young people. Y'all are the most important people on the planet. Other than our seniors, young people are the most important people on the planet, seriously. All right, so unless we have any other questions about how this process will be handled, you can go ahead and line up. We ask that when you ask a question, you ask it and please return back to your seat so that other people have the opportunity to get to the mic. Those right. lights are like Are we ready? Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Can, they, can we, is there anything we can do about that? Nah, let okay. your glow shine. You know, All right. Don't worry about the lights. <laughs> you need to have a TV show. <laughs> President Law, okay, I'm about to say, you asked for a TV show. All right, go right ahead. First of all, thank you um, for coming. I actually wasn't gonna get in, but different story. Um, my first introduction to you was actually um, through a Bell Hooks lecture um, at the New School. That's and full. I mean, I'm ashamed to say it, but thank you for that lecture. It was very powerful for me. Thank um, you. And during the lecture, you talked a lot about black masculinity and how it kind of stifled your ability to be passionate or to express um, emotions. And I, I wanted to know, um, how you reconcile being a part of um, a group, a fraternity, that in a lot of ways has perpetuated sexism, homophobia, um, uh, oppression, um, violence, a mm -hmm. lot of things, and how you reconcile that with the work that you're trying to do. I never said I reconciled it. Oh. <laughs> no. Um, I joined my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, which is the oldest black male Greek led organization in the country uh, eight years ago. Part of the reason why I joined it is because I've done a lot of work with black males specifically around the country. And one thing I realized as I was doing all this work, I barely had any black males in my life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, most of the people I've been around for years were women. And so I decided I wanted to be in spaces where there were men. And I made a conscious decision, because not because of present day, but because of uh, Dr. King, uh, Du Bois, uh, Paul Robeson, uh, Thurgood Marshall. These are all members of my fraternity. Freddie Douglas posthumously is a member of the fraternity. That's why I decided to join. I also decided to join because I felt like, you know, I wanted to be a part of uh, 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 helping to change some things on the inside, helping to influence some stuff. For example, in the first year or so I was in a fraternity, our fraternity became the first one in the country out of the black fraternities that actually started talking about domestic violence and, and, and mandated that organizations, our chapters around the country, actually take on a, a project uh, around domestic violence and educating the brothers in the organization. It's a process. I mean, patriarchy, just like racism, sexism, just like racism, is deeply rooted in the soil of this world, not just this country, as you know. And so, but I also believe something that Gloria Steinem said to me, you know, we've got to actually go into the spaces where this, this, this mindset, Gloria Steinem said even back in the 70s that one of the spaces that we need to be in is sports, you know? 
And, uh, and I think about it, a lot of work I've done the last few years has actually been interacting with college athletics, uh, professional uh, athletes, you know, uh, I won't say the names of people, but some very prominent folks who've engaged in behavior that's been destructive toward women and girls. And just like, let me get in these spaces. And then entertainment, you know, be it hip hop or David Bowie, who I love, but let's be real about it, David Bowie, Led Zeppelin, a lot of these folks, rock and roll, hip hop, have all been disrespectful to women and girls, you know. And so, but being in those spaces, I've been able to have some conversations. You know, I think about this as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of uh, Tupac Shakur dying, you know, um, in September of this year. And I, some of y'all know that I worked at Vibe Magazine for years. I did more interviews with Tupac when he was, uh, when he was alive than any, any other writer. And I was there in Vegas when he, uh, his death was announced. The most important co interview we ever did was when he was in jail at Rikers Island in New York, and he had been charged with sexual assault. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You know? And if you listen to the conversation, Pac admits he still maintained that he didn't do what he was charged with, but he said what he was guilty of is not stopping the other men from doing anything. You very rarely have men even have that level of kind of honesty and vulnerability. So I believe that we have to engage, engage, engage in those spaces. Otherwise, nothing's going to ever change. You know, um, that's how I feel. I feel that very strongly. Um, and it's not easy. You know, I've had some difficult conversations. I, uh, one school that uh, I spent this year of residency at, I, my sole purpose was to work with the fraternities on campus. And when I tell you that a lot, most of the young men were resistant to talking about sexism, resistant. You know what I mean? Um, men, mo many of them did what a lot of us men do. We pushed it back on y'all, blamed the women. You know what I'm saying? And these are, these are fraternities that were charged with date rape and all kinds of stuff, you know? Um, but the point was like, for me, we got to redefine manhood. There's no other way to say it. We have to redefine manhood away from patriarchy, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia. We got to move it away toward peace and love. We got to move it towards a healthy definition of masculinity. And like most men in this society, heterosexual men, cisgender men, myself, as I describe in my book, I grew up typical. I'm playing sports, I'm fighting, you know what I'm saying, as a boy. Uh, by the time you get to grade school, you're told that, you know, go around and grab girls' body parts in school. You know, think about how we're not being educated properly by, by mass media culture, by, by, by uh, the, the education we're getting. And so we already, by the time we're eight or nine years old, already viewing women as two things, girls as two things, caretakers or sex objects. It's not going to change unless we men help to make a change. It's really that simple, you know? Um, I'm feeling that every single day. I feel that responsibility, and I don't, no matter what I feel, I know it doesn't compare to anything that you all who identify as women feel every single day of your lives, you know? Uh, and fellas, we have, to, uh, we have to stand up, you know? And it's not enough to say, well, I, I'm the breadwinner, I show up in the household and stuff like that. No, we got a major, major problem in this, in this country around how we define masculinity. Most of the mass, mass shooters in this country are men. Are y'all aware of that? Most of the sex scandals in this country are men doing it. You know what I mean? And that says something. When you look at all the athletes who get in trouble, male athletes most of the time. So there's some real problems here around ego, masculinity, power, privilege that we are not confronting. We got to deal with it. And we got a question over there, and I'll also let you know my mic is hot, so if anyone doesn't want to go up to the microphone, if you'd rather me come to you, I will come to you and help take your question there. Right on. question on that side. Thank you, uh, Kevin. I really want to thank you for your remarks. Thank you and for having me. <clears throat> I stand here. I'm going to have a little, probably a little rambling answer because um, it's a. This whole topic is very sad. It makes me sad. Um, I am so glad you raised the issue of white privilege and that work, Tim Wise's work, Peggy McIntosh's work, and yes, unpacking the invisible knapsack yes, was just ripped the scales off my eyes for who I need to be in the workplace, who I need to be in my community. And um, I don't have a question so much as that I want to say that in the University of Maryland, I chair the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee for the Faculty Senate. And right now, we have a policy we're working on. Um, but I see so little that I can really influence and where I have seen the most impact with people expanding their view is mandatory training. I agree. And everyone who chooses to be in this room 
has some degree of you know openness and they want to be an ally and they want to learn and they recognize where their but their biases are or they don't know what they don't know and they think they should come and God love everybody who's here but what concerns me is uh, the need to get people who wouldn't choose to be here who should have some level of diversity training before they go and embark upon their job in fact um, I've been tweeting at CNN like don't pick pundits unless you know they're not going to get on television and like say things like uh, color blindness and be proud of it. Right. Um, so, I guess I, I guess my question, as I come around to it, is the need for mandating it and how we can do that. You know, we do have sexual harassment training here at Maryland that's electronic, and I'm so glad for that. But I think that there needs to be more that's force-fed and required because I don't think certain people are gonna opt in. So, thank you. I agree. Um, when I was talking about the college where I had to do the work with the fraternities, they were mandated to show up. They were like, you all have no choice because you literally are poisoning this community by your behavior. And that, you know, uh, I personally feel, the president's gone, but I'll say it anyway, um, that no college or university should be admitting students in these times or bringing in new faculty and staff if there's not real training around cultural competency. Hey man, you can say that the president's here. Let's be real. No, I'm saying, that, hold that, on. That is great words you just said there. Right? No, but I'm saying I wish he was here for me to hear it say it. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, that's better, yeah. But. <laughs> y'all invited the wrong one. I, no, no, I don't have a problem saying anything. I hope y'all know that at this point. But I think that's part of the issue. You know, people do opt out. You know, it doesn't matter to me, you know. Uh, and I feel like, like when I think back to my own education, I should have learned who I was. That should have been part of it. I should have learned about women. That should have been part of it. And it should have, I should have been learning about other people. That should have been a part of it. All of that was missing. And you wonder why we have all this destructive behavior happening all around the country. You know what I mean? And I, I don't even know how someone can get into a classroom I was speaking at a, 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 a so-called elite prep school on the West Coast. It was parents and, and uh, a few students, a few children of the parents, uh, mostly faculty and staff. One, one, one teacher got up who uh, was asked a question about diversity. You know what she said? She's been teaching photography for about 30 years. She said, to my knowledge, there's no people of color who are really competent photographers in America. I was like, wow, <laughs> Dr. Dill, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I got to keep a straight face, like, you know what I'm saying? But I was like, you're teaching photography, and you're supposed to be an expert on this, but you don't know about, you never heard of Gordon Parks. You never heard of Dr. Deborah Willis, who's the premier scholar in the history of black photography in the country. She's only at New York University, one of the most famous schools in the world. And I do think that whoever is in the leadership of these institutions, we do need the challenge. We need to say, hey, you need to be at this, you know, because otherwise nothing changes. You know, I, I feel like, you know, when I think back to first year orientation at my school, I don't know how it is here, but like, you know, we got, a, we got some shaving cream and we got a razor, you know what I mean? And you got some, some random conversations, but there was really nothing there that was talking about real issues that we're talking about here. And then what you end up doing is sending these students out here or the professors out there. I had a political science professor who was a PhD who actually said that, you know, slavery was vital to the economic system of the country. While students of color are sitting there like, yo, he basically said slavery was cool. And he's got a PhD, you know what I'm saying? And I don't care what your credentials are. If you're a racist, you're a racist. If you're a sexist, you're a sexist. You know what I mean? And I think that um, we've got to have a willingness to change this whole thing up, you know, because it's doing disservice to folks all around the country. People are being grossly miseducated generation to generation. What else do you call it? We're grossly miseducated gener generation to generation. And then we wonder why we have the problems that we have, you know? Or you have people holding on to an old way of teaching or are people holding on to some, some archaic notions of, of uh, you know, what it is to be who you are in this country, you know? We just can't seem to let go of the past. When I hear the Republicans say, let's make America great again, all they're really saying is we're gonna hold on to the way it's always been. That's all they're really saying. And we don't care who this alienates because we're gonna hold on to this just like that small white minority in apartheid South Africa. You feel me? And so what do the people do? If you are well-meaning, you gotta resist, you gotta resist, you gotta resist. Back to Sonia Sanchez, resist. You can't accept this, because it's denying you your own humanity. Even if I was a white brother or sister, I would be offended that I don't even know anything about myself, and that I don't know anything about anybody else. 
I'd be offended by that, and I'm on a, co I'm on a college campus. I, you should be offended by that. How do I not know this stuff? You know what I mean? Except some stereotypes. All right, so what we're going to do is I think it's best if we go each side of the mic so everybody gets a chance to talk. Can we okay. come right here? Yes, ma'am. I'm short, so. Do you need a chair? No, I'm, I, I, this actually, I'm a runner, so this scratches my legs. All right, get, get the work in how you can. Okay. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you, though, for asking. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so first, I'm thankful that you're here, and I'm actually surprised that you're here and happy that you're here because the University of Maryland is where I received my greatest education on racial injustice through racial trauma here during my four years. Um, so I'm very excited that things seem to be attempting to shift in a different direction here. Um, but you mentioned um, that we should be proactive as opposed to reactive when it comes to fighting racial injustice, and you praised Beyonce and Kendrick Lamar um, for being subversive and using their platform. I've been blessed with the platform in digital media, and we are all blessed with the platform through social media, but I'm finding that being proactive can be just as dangerous as being reactive. Um, I could, for being outspoken at my job and speaking up and recruiting people of color, I could be fired, let alone just stereotyped as this like hotel black girl, you know. So I'm curious as to how can we protect ourselves while still being proactive. I wrote about this actually and my mother and I had this conversation constantly because she knows that if I were pulled over by a white police officer, if I were stereotyped, if I were racially profiled, she in her mind knows that I would say something and she trained me like throughout my entire life how to act around white folks. And similar to how your mother kind of trained you in your book that you wrote. Yeah. And do I go against her training because I know that if I don't do it, like why should I wait for someone else to do it? Why should I wait for the Dr. King of my generation when I could be that Dr. King? Not saying that I am Dr. King, but how do, how do I protect myself and my mother and my family members and my friends while still trying to create a life for myself and that is free of racial injustice for myself and my mother and my friends? Wow. Great questions. Don't leave. Don't leave. Um, those are excellent questions. First of all, in my lifetime, since becoming what we call conscious at age 18, back in college, because of the trauma I experienced in college, which you just described eloquently, uh, I've been kicked out of school. I've been fired from jobs. I've had death threats. Um, you know, people saying, you crazy. My own mama saying to me, as I say in my memoir, you know, well, you remember what, they ha you remember what happened to Dr. King, right? I'm like, well, dang, you know, he got killed, right? I get that. And at some point, I just had to say, you know what? F it, man. I got to do what I got to do. And I'm not going to let someone else's fear become my fear. You feel what I'm saying? And I'm, sometimes it's going to include your own family members, you know? I love my mother. I love my family. I love my friends. But I realize some of them are not going to do what I do. And it's OK. I got to do it. You know what I mean? Uh, because it, there's a saying during the civil rights movement that once you become aware, it's a river of no return. You can't go backwards unless you basically are lying to yourself at that point. Now, what I wish I would have learned a long time ago that I know now is that as I do this work, which is daily, this is, this is my life. I'm an activist. This is my life. You know what I'm saying? This is not a game for me. Even when I'm on a train coming down here, when I get on a train going back, we're doing work in the community back in New York, you know what I'm saying, or somewhere else in the country. I didn't understand the importance of self-love and self-care. You know, not a single speaker that we brought to Rutgers University when I was there ever talked about self-care, self-care, or self-love. They talked about the struggle, talked about the movement, they talked about the revolution, they talked about everything, but no one ever said, hey man, you might want to go to therapy. It wasn't until I engaged in some destructive behavior that it was solely out of control. I'm like, he needs to go to counseling. You know what I mean? You might want to practice some yoga, homeboy, some meditation. You feel what I'm saying? Hey, Kevin, you know what? Soul food, which is a part of your cultural narrative, which is an important part of how we eat, we share as people. Every group has their food, right? But guess what? Maybe you might want to go towards veganism and hit up restaurants like New Vegan where you can still get your whatever restaurant. I don't know the restaurant. You know what I mean? I ain't going to diss the restaurant because I don't know the restaurant. She's shaking her head furiously. No, I, just... I shake my head to... No, I like chicken. Oh, you like chicken? <laughs> Well, if I, can I make a racial joke? Because chicken is like black folks' first cousin. I get it. And I had a hard time giving up chicken. I don't judge anybody. If you want to eat meat, eat meat. I'm just saying, for me, I, could, I realized that my activism cannot be separated from my health and wellness, spiritually, physically, mentally. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I wish someone had said to me, You're, you, you have to develop holistically. You know, I was. Here I am. You know, I said, someone asked me, I don't know who it was, like, how did you publish 12 books? I was like, I started out, I was publishing 
professionally as a writer, when I was 20 years old, still at Rutgers University, I was doing that. I could articulate about race issues, but then I was messed up on gender issues. I was messed up on other issues. I was messed up on my health, mentally, physically, spiritually. It's got to be holistic. That's what shifted for me. You know, I got to take care of myself as I do this work because this work around race or gender or whatever your issue is, it is going to destroy you if you don't take some time for yourself periodically. You know what I mean? Are you ever afraid? I'm afraid all the time, but you know what? Nah, let me take that back. <laughs> Um, I'm afraid of dogs, you know what I'm saying? I am afraid, I've had a fear of dogs since I was a kid. Like that people won't buy your book, or people won't read what you write, that you'll be fired, that you'll be outcast in some type of way. Let me tell you something. Or that you'll be threatened. I, let me tell you something, like, and that's an excellent question. Sometimes I make more speaking at a college like this than my mom ever made in a year raising me. What right do I got to be afraid? You know what I'm saying? Um, I know what we survived. It's like, what, what I was afraid of was when I was growing up was being stuck and trapped in my situation, never getting out of it. You know what I mean? My world was like the block I lived on in the hood, five blocks that way, that way, that way. That was it. I just, you know, and so I feel a lot like, I remember when, when Tupac was alive, one thing he said, man, he said, I just was happy to hear my voice on the radio one time. When I first published my first article when I was 20 years old, when I published my first book, I'm like, this is all gravy. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, what is the point of life if it's not to, to help other people? I've been blessed to overcome a lot of stuff, man. And, and, and because of what I experienced, the justice gene has always been in me. And so I can't be afraid when there's real suffering out here. That woman that I told you about who had her ribs cracked and I talked over the weekend, we, went, we talked on the phone for two hours because of how I've been blessed and trained by people like a Bell Hooks, like a Evans or whoever it is. I'm like, okay, here's some strategies for you to get out of this destructive situation. We have a responsibility not to be afraid. Was Harriet Tubman afraid when she went back and forth to free other people? You know, even some of them who were scared, they, they were happy being slaves. You know what I mean? And so I don't have, I don't, was, 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 was Fannie Lou Hamer, after she got busted upside the head, was she afraid? You know what I mean? You know, think about it. Dr. King's last speech, the mountaintop speech, is essentially his eulogy. He's like, I'm not fearing any man. You know, my eyes, my eyes have seen the glory to come into the Lord. I don't fear death. I don't fear anything. You know what I'm saying? I really do not fear anything. Because I feel that fear ultimately is a prison. Now, you, you sh it's a human emotion to be scared, scared for a moment. Then I got to be like, let me draw on the strength of my ancestors. Let me draw on the strength of my mama and my Aunt Kathy and my Aunt Bertie and my great my grandmother, Lottie. I'm like, if they could go through all the stuff they went through, then I don't have any right to, to make any excuses. Y'all feel what I'm saying? And I think anyone in this room, no matter where you come from, y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, whenever you're feeling any kind of fear or trepidation, uh, think about all the powerful people from your community who were able to rise up out of amazing circumstances. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I, I, we need fearless people out here. We got enough cowards out here. We got enough people who have no backbone who tell me that they'll shush you all the time. And so I try to sound my, surround myself with people who are equally fearless. Surround yourself in a community. I believe in creating communities of people who are really trying to be healthy and whole who also are fearless and unapologetic for who they are. And if someone over here is calling you the Hotep sister, the people over here are saying it with love. You feel what I'm saying? So I believe in also what shifted for me is making sure that I'm around people who are affirming. I didn't, I didn't understand that stuff, you know? Um, even 10 years ago, I didn't understand. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't understand any of it. Now I do. Because otherwise, you will self-destruct. You know what I mean? Thanks. Thank you. Bless you. Yes, sir. I got attention right over here. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I guess you. I was ju just a bit confused about your criticism of Hillary Clinton. Um, on one hand, um, uh, y you were noting that um, there's a lot of sexism in the world, but um, on the other hand, you, uh, you criticized Hillary Clinton's, um, but specifically her, her husband's actions towards uh, the African American community. And um, I guess I, j I don't understand why she should be held accountable to Bill Clinton's actions um, because Bill Clinton isn't running for president. Hillary Clinton is running for president, but w uh, we wouldn't um, we wouldn't criticize Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders' uh, spouses for what they're doing. Um, I would. Uh, why why even bring up? Um, Bill Clinton's actions um, if Hillary Clinton de didn't even play a part in it? Well, actually, that's not true, sir. This is why um, I said that reading and research is important. I lived through the Clinton years. I was in my 20s during that time, and she was very actually... Are you okay? Okay. 
She, um, she was actually very active in a lot of the policies that were shaped during the Clinton years. That's why I bring it up, and also bring it up because she brings it up. She says, well, here's what the country was like when you know, Bill was president. So I'm like, okay, if you're saying this is what it was like economically, it was welfare for other people, well, here's some other stuff that never seems to get to talked about, mass incarceration, what welfare reform did to women of color. She brought it up. You guys try to do the research. It's all the information is out there. You know what I mean? I believe, you know, and part of it because I, I, I take history very seriously, it's like if people are going to say stuff, then we have a right to ask some critical questions. I also don't think... You know, I don't think anyone, if you're, if you're a public figure, myself included, in any form, or you're an elected official, or you want to be an elected official, I don't see, it, everything is, you should be held accountable. You know what I'm saying? You should be, we should be able to ask questions. I think it's, it's it is uh, unwise to have anyone, just like you asked me a question, it's unwise to have anyone standing in front of you and saying, here's what I'm going to do, then you can't ask questions about their record. You know what I mean? She was right there with them. She talked about the policies that she helped to shape. In fact, she was one of the folks driving you know, her version of health care, which has now become known as Obamacare. She was there when the whole issue around welfare reform did. She was a part of that, sir. She says it. You know, all you have to do is go to YouTube and all the footage is out there. I'm not making this stuff up. Does that mean that I don't like Hillary Clinton? Absolutely love, I, like many black folks, very, we're all, a lot of us are very fond of the Clintons, but it doesn't mean that they're God. You know what I'm saying? They're not God and I have a problem with us deifying people in general no matter who they are, you know? And I think we gotta uh, be very careful of just saying, it's almost like when um, someone's, black folks will, and I'll, I'll flip it. Some folks in the black community gets very sensitive as a black person's getting criticized about certain things. I'm like, well, if this person is whack, they should be, we should say that this person's whack. I'm not gonna say just because they're black, I can't say something about them. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not even, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not gonna, I don't believe in just rubber stamping someone because they happen to be a part of a group that's been marginalized, a black person of color or a woman or someone from the LGBTQ community. If they're whack, they're whack. If they have some wacky or imbalanced stuff out there, we should be able to raise questions about that. Hopefully to make them a better and more consistent human being if they claim to be a leader. You feel what I'm saying? That's what I think about. Hi, Mr. Powell. My Kevin, name is Kevin. Oh. Evan. Hey. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm a senior here at the University of Maryland. Yes, ma'am. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. You for did mention, me. Um, you know, the need for these exhausting conversations, emotionally exhausting. And I found myself feeling emotionally exhausted while you brought some of these topics up. And you know, you're African. You're an African American male. I'm a Latina woman. Um, and so there are differences, but then there are very, there are many similarities. Absolutely. And I think that the one is that. There, that there's that suffering that we've had since you know we were brought up and throughout our childhood. Um, I want to know in your work how you found a way to break down the barriers that people put up to not be vulnerable because in order to have these sort of conversations and let ourselves be and have that suffering really show through, you have to allow you know these walls to come down. And for many of us who have suffered, you know, that's obviously like our first instinct is to not let anyone in. Um, I was undocumented for 15 years. Mm. I just recently became a permanent resident and I found so much power in being undocumented and sharing my story. So I just want to be able to know how, how you found how you found it in your work, because as an ally now, I feel that I need to change some of my my way of going around um, with helping out the undocumented and the Latino community. So thank you. Well, I think you said, you answered your own question. I think you all have to use your voices. No matter who you are, you use your voices. I think when the first book that I ever read that really showed me how powerful a voice is was the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was 18 at Rutgers. And like I said, I had never heard of Malcolm. And I was blown away by how fear, fearless, someone raised that word up here. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, and I just think you got to speak your truth, you know, um, and unapologetically. The, this memoir, people keep saying to me, man, it's so raw, it's so raw. I'm like, you know, what, I, what was I going to do, write a book where I just lie about my life? I mean, that makes no sense. But I found in writing the book and speaking and speaking, even, it doesn't be on the stage, but, you know, even if it's a circle of people, you know, you, you become a new person. You're reinventing yourself. And I just think there's something wrong if we just are completely closed up and we're not willing to express who we are, especially if stuff has been hurting us. I mean, do y'all want to be in pain for the rest of your lives? Do y'all want to be traumatized for the rest of your lives? I don't. And I'm like, I got to get this off my chest. And sometimes it might be in the form of counseling. Sometimes it might be in church. You know, sometimes the church I go to, folks are running laps around the church. They do whatever they do, you know. 
But if, if it's not spirit, uh, religious or uh, organized religion, it's got to be something where you are letting this stuff out of you because it, it ends up hurting you, I feel. You know? And I think that's very dangerous. Um, so I think keep telling your story. Keep sharing your story because you, you'll be amazed at how many people will be empowered by it. Um, that play that I was saying we were working on in New York is called She. Uh, some of the women have said they don't know if they want to share their voices. And one of the things that was just said back to them by other women in the group is that in telling your story, if you can get to that point, you, know, you don't know how many women in that audience who have been the victims of some form of sexual violence you'll be touching just by them being there and hearing your story. And so it's important. Same thing with you know, undocumented sisters and brothers. You know, I hate the term illegal immigrants. I hate the term illegal aliens. Y'all are human beings. And you, those are things that need to be said. You know what I mean? So people know that they matter, their lives matter, right? Thank you. Love the Yankee hat. I was just told that um, we can only take a few more questions, so I stress that if you do have a question, please um, make your way over to a mic or raise your hand, and I want to get through all these questions. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, hey. So you kind of uh, touched on this question already, but I was wondering what you thought as a writer was the role of um, writing in evoking social change. I think it's very important. Are you a writer? Uh, no, I meant as you as a writer. Oh, me as a writer. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's important. Um, like, uh, when, I, when I was 18, uh, I realized I'm an activist. I had I'd known I wanted to be a writer since I was like 11 years old, 12 years old. But it was like, I wanted to be a fiction writer, actually. I wanted to write fiction. But it was when I got to college, I started writing for the school papers, and I was like, you know what? I could actually use my, my pen, my voice in this way to talk about issues that matter to me. And so ever since then, it's always merged. I, I think that you have a responsibility, no matter what your art is. It could be writing, it could be dancing, it could be filmmaking. I'm not saying everything has to be socially conscious, everything has to be political. But if there's stuff going on in the world, you know, like one of my friends, Dave Zarin, the great sports writer who lives in this area, this brother is one of the best sports writers in the country, but he writes about sports through the lens of race, through gender, through class. You know, the brother's also Jewish, through anti-Semitism, through different things. I mean, that's incredible to me. You know, when I first read his work, I was like, this is the kind of sports writing I, I want to read. William Roden from the New York Times, who wrote the book $40 Million Slave about how black athletes are treated. That's the kind of sports writing I want to read. And so I think you have a responsibility, if you're aware and you see these things going on in your society, to talk about it. And that's what I do. I have to. All right, we're going back to this side. Angel, what's up? What's up, Kevin? Chilling, chilling. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I, I mean, I thank you so much for everything you said. I um, just have a question. As I, as I mentioned, I'm getting my PhD soon this summer, and women's studies. Oh, this summer. Yeah. And it's been a long, long, hard um, journey, as you can see. I'm, I'm a triple threat black woman with disability. Mm. Um, but I guess one of my concerns is, you know, I see like sometimes when groups of minority, people from minority backgrounds get into positions of power, um, they, for lack of a better word, like forget, you know, how to lift as we climb or whatever. Yes, yeah. And I've experienced the violence of that, like in academia um, particularly. Um, and so I wanted to know like, what do you do to stay grounded because there's this, um, I don't know if you heard of Derek Bell. He's a critical race theorist. He has yep. this thing called interest convergence theory that like I love, and yep. I I've found and I've observed that like you know in order for systems of oppression to justify themselves, like they have to have you know a, they have to let a few of us out, you know, so they can say hey like you know they're successful, like why can't you be successful too or whatever, kind of mm. like the Bill Bill Cosby theory or whatever. Um, and so well, you see what I, what I don't want to be him. used in, in that way. And I see some people, minority groups, um, um, embracing that. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's a problem. So I just wanted to know, like, you know, what suggests, because it's seductive. You know what I mean? Like, like getting white approval and approval groups in power is seductive, you know? Yeah. And, and so when you think about, like, tenure, for example, and the, and the seven-year process, and they say, well, you know, just do what they say, and then after you get tenure, you can do what you want. But by then, like, you've been conditioned, and you've, you know, you've, you've, um, you know, uh, have conformed to their ideology and way of thinking, whether you realize it or not. And so I'm just thinking about, like, how can we subvert the system, like, be a part of some of these spaces, be, but also use them for our interest to help lift as we climb, rather than, you know, just being a part of the process. Well, I think, excellent question. I just think that, um, I always ask myself, am I going to be self-loving or self-hating? 
And if I'm self-loving, hopefully that means I'm also gonna love my community. You know, I love all people, as I said from the very beginning, but I certainly, that includes the black community. I love who I love who I am, you know what I mean? And that means that I think very consciously of how I relate to the black community. I think very consciously about systemic racism, about white privilege, about white supremacy, whatever you wanna to, want to call, it, call it the terms that have been thrown out today. That means that I have a responsibility you know, to make sure that I, I, I am reaching out to my community and supporting my community by all available means. You know what I mean? Do I support black businesses? Oh yeah, conscious of it. You know, and not an apologetic about it. You know what I'm saying? Do I make sure when I have interns that at least some of the students, you know, are black students? Absolutely. Do I go to HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities? Oh yeah, when I go to schools to visit, I don't just go to prep schools or boarding schools, I go to schools in the hood. I go towards the students who are C and D and F students, not just the A students, not just the honor society students. What I'm getting at, there has to be an intentionality to why y'all are doing this stuff. Like, why are you here? You know what I'm saying? Why are you here? What is your purpose here? And do you really think you got here all by yourself? Because that's the first problem is self-denial, self-denial, that somehow I made it to the University of Maryland, I made it to this, this bachelor's degree or this master's degree, this PhD all by yourself. No, there was folks who sacrificed so that you could be here. And you do have a historical, cultural, spiritual, moral responsibility to reach back, as you said, Sister Angel, and help as many people as possible. You know what I mean? Uh, not only am I physically tired or exhausted by racism or the other forms of oppression, I'm also tired because I realize there's so few of us who actually do this on a regular basis. You know what I mean? And so some of us get called over and over again, Kev, it's June, my son or daughter's about to graduate, can you help us get a scholarship for college? You know what I mean? Kev, my son just got out of jail, can you help me? Kev, I just got my ribs cracked by my boyfriend, can you help me? And I'm like, if I don't do it, I don't know if anyone else is gonna respond. Because a lot of us have really, you know, we, we've, we've lost our minds since the civil rights era, some of us, and some of the elders here know what I'm talking about. Some of us have lost our minds, man, where we actually believe that our individual success is the only thing that matters. You know, I've actually had professional, college-educated black folks say to me, man, is, are things really that bad out there? I'm like, well, where have you been, homie? You know what I'm saying? Where have you been? And so what I say is what Gandhi said, Sister Angel, let's be what we want to see. We, that's what we have to do. We have to model it. One of my favorite examples, since you're getting your PhD this summer, I'm so proud of you for doing it, um, Dr. Mary Emma Graham, she's at the University of Kansas. I was just there for a two-day residency. She runs the only program on the history of black writing in the country. It came out of a centennial celebration uh, for Langston Hughes in 2002. He's born in 1902, right? And Dr. Mary M. Graham, to show you how gangster she is with hers, she has generations of students who've come behind her who will now all also have their PhDs. That's what I'm talking about. In other words, she's multiplying herself. And she still does her thing, she does her fellowship, she goes overseas and studies, you know, she's publishing, all that kind of stuff. But she understands that her success, quote unquote, is inextricably linked to all these other black folks. It all goes together, you know what I mean? And so I, I can't even imagine not supporting my own community. You know, where I live in Brooklyn, New York, the, you know, there's, there's, there's a Hasidic Jewish community, there's an Italian community, there's a Russian community, there's a, 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 a Chinese community. Every city you go to has a Chinatown. No one criticizes anybody else for supporting their community. You should support your community, whatever community you come from. But then also have the courage and the ability to do a braille hook set, which is across cultural boundaries. You do both. Don't let people tell you it's either or. I'm going to always support my own community. And there are going to be times when I'm like, okay, all of us, let's come together, y'all. Let's do this Rainbow Coalition thing. Let's do it. You know? But we need it. You know what I'm saying? We need it more than anything. And I got to show up. As a black man who never saw a single positive black male role model, K through 12, never had one as a teacher, principal, nothing. The first black male role model I ever had was when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, a dead black man. That's why I show up at schools in New York all the time, particularly where the black and Latino boys are. You feel what I'm saying? Because I know a lot of them come from the same background as me, single mother, no father. I got a responsibility to do that. I don't get paid for that stuff. Speaking at a University of Maryland, y'all want to be really honest about it. Speaking at a University of Maryland gives me the ability to do all the stuff I do for free in the community. That's how it works. You know, y'all wonder how it works? That's how it works. No benefits, I get these honorariums, I do the work in the community. That's what happens. Um, thank you thank for you. Thank you for coming to speak, Mr. Pratt. My, my name's Kaylin Cage. I'm a third year PhD student in mechanical engineering. Wow, all and these so PhDs. To, so I'm just, I'm really glad. Like, I just wanted to um, ask you just two questions, but um, I just wanted to 
set the kind of context of my questions. So like my, the sixth grade, I'm from PG County. And so if you don't know about PG County, it's like one of the richest black African yeah. American places. And so coming from this area and growing <laughs> up in this area, I still felt like I didn't get real history. So my sixth grade teacher was the first teacher that talked to me about Egypt and black people outside of the Americas. And then I got introduced to Tupac who like literally changed my life. So in parallel to me loving engineering, I love history. So I spend a lot of my time in mm. learning about black people, who we are and what that means in the global context. And so um, my first question is, in, in terms of interracial racism, I, I think it, when, you, when you ended your presentation with love, I think that I, I agree with you that that is the key to everything. But we, a lot of the kind of challenges I face in dealing with little girls, little black girls in communities where they have young mothers is that they don't love themselves and they don't know why they don't love themselves. They right. don't love their skin complexion. Right. They don't like, you have people at a, on a social level talking about, oh, you're light skin, dark skin, but it just goes so deeper when you're dealing with a child that doesn't even realize that the melanin in your skin protects you. It's, it's not only a scientific benefit that you have of being on the earth, but it's something that is good for you. So like, how do you combat that stuff that we have internally within the black community? Because in order for us to have that love, I think little black boys and little black girls in poverty stricken areas, especially when they have crack hit, I mean, sorry, especially when their parents were you addicted to substances. Uh, because like the DC it area, just came you, out. you've been plagued with, I'm sorry, with, with substances because I deal with this, like I, I'm working I'm in the community. And so you have these parents, you have parents that they have been addicted to substances yeah. and, they, and, they, and the kids don't have formal training. So they're like, they hate themselves. They don't know why they hate themselves. So if they hate themselves, of course they're gonna go next door and shoot somebody that looks like them because they don't like themselves. It's a, it's a reflection of how they feel about themselves. Can or, I jump in for a second? Mm -hmm. but no, I'm not, I, mm -hmm. I, I respect everything you're saying, but I also want us to be careful of, of attributing all this just to poor black people because now that I am a middle-class black person and a professional Negro, which is what I am, um, some of the most self-hating, defeatist behavior I've ever seen has actually been in the black middle class and black upper class communities. Um, colorism, mm -hmm. criticizing people for natural hair versus non-natural hair. Uh, who gets wealthier than Bill Cosby? What he, look, look what he was saying. I was actually at one of the speeches where he dis disparaged black folks, mm -hmm. poor black folks. Um, I mean, we can go on and on and on. And so what I'm getting at, to me, one of the biggest religions on the planet, it's not Judaism, it's not Christianity, it's not Islam, it's this little thing we call racism. Yeah. And many of it, most of us believe in it, whether we realize it or not. Mm -hmm. And it comes out in very profound ways. It even comes out, you know, when you see a Zoe Saldana, who I think is a talented actress, not seeing anything wrong with her putting on blackface to play Nina Simone in this Nina Simone movie, which I hope that y'all all consider not seeing and going to watch the documentary that came out last year, what happened with Miss Simone, and not understanding the history of, of blackface and how harmful that was, not just to black people, to all people. And so I think that, you know, what really needs to be deconstructed is if you all work with young people, younger than you even, because y'all are all young people here, is like every single time I'm around young people of all races, but it's especially when it's young people of color, it's a majority black and Latino community, y'all are geniuses, y'all are geniuses, y'all are geniuses. Y'all are beautiful, y'all are handsome. I don't care what you look like, your body type, every single one of you is valuable. We need to say that. It wasn't until I was 22 years old in deep trouble in a therapy session with a black man who was older than me that someone said to me that I was a prince. It never been said to me. I was told that I was nothing. I was told that I was a disadvantage. I was told that I was a minority. I despise that word. I was told every negative thing you can think of about being a black, young black man in America. 22 years old, finally someone says to me, you're a prince. And so words are powerful. Yeah. Words are powerful. And so I think if you're in those spaces, you got to challenge that stuff, you know, because even if you're not there, you know, even if it's just one moment, that planting of a seed, you know, is, is critical. And I think that we need to show folks, you know, examples of the diversity of the beauty. My own mother is your complexion, but because the way I was socialized, I actually believed that my mother wasn't attractive until I became aware of like, man, we're beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's like, then I started looking at my mother in a completely different way, and she raised me. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense, y'all? You know what I'm saying? And so but I think- I, Before you, I was just gonna go to that point, because I wasn't okay. saying it for young, like just because they're poor, because I'm talking about not young people that are yes, just poor, but Sorry. young people across that span the gamut. But in, in the context of that, when they say that, 
it, it goes up to like the Kendrick Lamars. Like a lot of people, there was a backlash of that of a woman that was a a, a black woman that was like angry because he had a other a, a woman that was of Latino. Uh, I think she's a has, has a Latino background, and so they were saying that basically the Kanye what Kanye West did when you get on, you know. But I just I I feel like because the images they also contribute to the feeling like the children don't Excuse have self worth, and so I just it's. That, that's why I was like leading to that, but yeah, sorry. You okay? <laughs> I didn't want it because I didn't want it. I know he's like, I, I, I think you guys are trying to- You were giving her the so. sign language? I was just told um, for the sake of scheduling, we yeah, want to get through sorry. one more question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Hi. Hey. Um, I'm Tess and I'm a 10th grader right now. Oh, wow, high school. Um, yeah. Awesome. And a year ago when I was in freshman year, um, the PTSA sponsored a Selma movie screening and we watched Selma and then we had a conversation afterwards. Yes, ma'am. And that conversation totally opened up my eyes to the privilege that I had and really how much racism still exists today in the in America. Yes, ma'am. And so this year I'm working with the P PTSA to start um, sort of a three night seminar thing where we talk one night about African Americans, one night about um, the Latino community, and one night about Muslims and all the discrimination that they face. And so I want this to not only be an opportunity for people who are suffering to be heard, but also for people who, I w like me, to sort of admit like, yes, you are ignorant on the subject and you are the issue. And it was very embarrassing kind of for me originally to say I am the issue because I do not know enough about this to make change. Mm. So, and you're obviously very good at having people open up. How do I encourage students to open up and say, I am the problem, but I can help. I can change the way I am now and start being part of the solution. Wow. I certainly was not thinking like that in the 10th grade. <laughs> that's, that's deep and brilliant. Um, you create a safe space. You create a space. You create a space where people are clear, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, I also believe, you know, you were talking about um, black folks, Latino folks, Muslim folks, Middle Eastern folks, Arab folks, not only just the discriminations that we've been through, but also let's share some of the things that they have done. You know what I mean? Because I feel like that's often missing from the conversation. Like, well, look at all how these folks have just survived all this stuff. Look at all the misery they've been through. But how about like, yo, you know what I'm saying? When I was growing up and my mom and I had no, um, we only had one bedroom and I had to sleep in a folding bed. I wish I had known that a black woman had invented that folding bed, you know what I'm saying? I wish I'd have known when I get in the car, stop at a traffic light, that a black man had created the traffic light, you know? And not only do I need to know it, but black history is American history, or Latino history is, is American history, or Native American history is American history, all of it is, you know? And, you know, I would challenge people, like, you know, what do you actually know about this? What do you know about yourself? You know, what were you before you became white, you know? And what does privilege mean to you? What does power mean to you? And people think that it's called someone the N-word or scrawling something somewhere or putting on blackface. No, it's indifference, too, you know, not thinking that it even matters, you know? And so I do think you got a challenge, and I think it's beautiful that it's on a high school level because hopefully some of those students will, won't be the folks coming to college and joining the fraternities that I've had to do work with where they think it's cool to paint blackface or to rape female students or any of the other kind of destructive stuff that we see on these college campuses. I think you got to challenge people, you know? And I think that um, a lot of times I'll hear people say, well, you know, can, can young people handle this? I think young people can handle anything because y'all are dope, you know what I'm saying? And I just think you got to push the envelope a little bit. What should y'all do? A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Read the book cover to cover. A People's History of the United States. You know, read some books that actually talk about American history from, the, from a perspective other than the perspectives that we are used to getting. Read Lerone Bennett's Before the Mayflower. You know, a basic text about black history, which is American history. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's what I would recommend. Um, and I just think that, you know, and challenge. You know, when I said the teacher did not know any uh, photographers of color, you know, it was the white students at the high school who stood up and said, well, we demand that you learn, and we need to learn about these other people who t take pictures as well. And so I think y'all got to ask, you know, some of the folks at your school, and they might be here, like, why are we reading Shakespeare every year, but we're not getting into Zaki Shange or Lorraine Hansberry, you know? You know, why are we reading, you know, John Keats, but what about Pablo Neruda or Santa Maria Estevez, you know? What about other writers? What about other people? You know, so we can actually be well-rounded people going into this world, not, you know, folks unwittingly perpetuating all this stuff up here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I think that the parents and the teachers should be a part of that conversation because they need to learn too. Thank you. The last one, is that Liam? Hey Jeff, how's it going? What up brother Liam? Uh, just before I 
uh, ask my question. Just want to let everyone know I'm a sophomore journalism major here, and Kev gave me my first opportunity to write, and I'm eternally grateful for it. Oh wow, thank you. I met um, him here a couple years ago. He's a talented writer, so I just he's talented. Yeah. Uh, so my so 18 months ago, a video surfaced on TMZ. It was leaked. It had happened in May that Ray Rice hit his girlfriend in the elevator. Totally changed the layout of domestic violence by professional sports leagues. Looking back at where we are in March of 2016, how do you think these professional leagues have handled domestic violence? Oh, terribly. I mean, you know, if it's on video, you get penalized forever, like Ray Rice, but there's so many cases out there, like so many cases in baseball, uh, in baseball, in football, in basketball, you know. Uh, even we, we even know as Peyton Manning was retiring yesterday, you know, he has a case that has been surfacing around for the last 20 years or so. I just think back to the original point, the, the first person asked the question, I mean, sexism is normalized, just like racism is normalized. And it's a whole kind of uh, jockocracy that protects all of it, the commissioners, the owners, you know, the executives, and the players, and men, fellas, we have privilege, you know what I'm saying? We have gender privilege. And so we will turn our backs on stuff or act like it didn't happen or we'll, you know, give someone a new contract even though they may have been accused of certain things, you know, over and over again. And I just think it, 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 it says a lot about how we do not value women and girls in this society where sports is more important than, than, than the lives of women and girls. I mean, I'm going to be really honest with y'all, uh, particularly with football. And I grew up, I'm a huge sports fan. I'm a huge sports fan since I was a kid. Not just the brutality of football at this point, but just seeing – you know, the correlation between this very violent sport and all these men acting out against women and girls, I don't think that's a coincidence. Y'all know what I'm saying? I don't think it's a coincidence, and it's, it's really problematic to me. I can't be, I can't stand here and say, hey, I'm a pro-feminist man, and then act like this stuff is not going on. I can't act like sex trafficking is not going on during every Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's real. Am I right, y'all? This is real. And so I think that we as men, including, you know, folks like you who are interested in being sports writers or are sports writers, y'all got to raise these questions. You know, and I think men who are sports fans, y'all got to raise the questions. Like, you know, why is this acceptable? Why does this keep going on and we keep sweeping it under the rug? You know, or we'll give someone a, you know, someone will be suspended for a few games or they'll be fined and stuff like that. And then it's business as usual. Is there real counseling going on? As these athletes come into the professional leagues, is there real counseling going on about what, what is manhood? What is a man? What is a man? You talk, you know, we're talking about diversity here. Like, have you ever even had a conversation about manhood? I'll end it here. The, when I was working with those fraternities at that one school, that's how I started every session around gender violence on the campus. I said, each fraternity, I said, tell me what a man is. You know what they would say? Responsible, accountable, leader. They went through a whole list of stuff. And when it, every, every session after they said it, I said, you just define my mother. Now, can you tell me what a man is after that? They couldn't answer the question. You know, most of them knew nothing about women's history. They didn't even know who they were, nothing like that. And we wonder why they engage in the behavior they're in. We need to redefine manhood. I'm going to keep saying that until I die. We've got to redefine manhood away from all this destructive behavior. Otherwise, this stuff is just going to continue. There's like 161 cases of college campus sexual assault cases right now around the country. And some of them are athletes who are going to be going to the professional ranks, you know? And if we look at it like this, one out of four women in this room uh, or one out of four in this country are the victims of form, some form of sexual violence, that means that someone in this room has experienced it. Am I right, ladies? Someone has experienced it in their lifetime. Why is that okay? It will not end, Brother Liam and all the men here, until we men help to make it end. It's really that simple. Real quick, you said redefine masculinity, right? Yeah, redefine manhood. Can you, like, kind of say what that looks like? Yeah. For me, it's, it's peace, practicing peace, practicing love. Uh, being vulnerable, being emotionally available, respecting women and girls as your equals, as your equals, as your equals, actually taking seriously, learning about the contributions of women and girls to this country, uh, to, this, to this world, taking some time actually learning about your mama and your sisters and your aunties and your grandmother, the women in your life, you know? Uh, you have a chief diversity officer, that's what diversity means to me. Do you actually even know about the people around you, you know what I mean? That, all of those are definitions of manhood. Uh, a man is not violent, a man, a man is not brutal, you know? I mean, that's, those are def definitions that we've been taught. This is what a man is. Men don't cry, that's absurd. That, isn't that, I mean, that's absurd, men don't cry. Why, why can't I cry? If I feel something, why can't I cry? You know what I mean? Or we'll, we'll, we'll get homophobic and say that you're acting a certain way. Or remember how they were saying when the young girl was playing in the Little League Baseball World Series that she was throwing like, you know, throw like a girl, but they flipped it. I mean, think about all the stuff that we were taught growing up about what a man or a boy is. I mean, it's ridiculous, and it puts you in this thing called a male prison. That's what it does. And then, you know, you act out, Ray Rice or anyone, 
And the next thing you know, like I was watching Peyton Manning's press conference yesterday, a woman reporter was the only reporter out of all those reporters there, a whole bunch of men, who even had the courage to ask him a question about the sexual assault case from 20 years ago, and he shut it down. You know what I mean? A man takes responsibility for his actions and answers the question. You know what I mean? Read my book. There's a lot of stuff in that book I was not comfortable writing. The stuff I've written in my life that I'm not comfortable writing. But I'm like, I got to tell the truth. A man is honest. You're transparent. You know what I'm saying? A man doesn't come to the University of Maryland, says all this stuff, and then the moment he gets off the stage, goes and collects numbers from the women in the audience. That's not a man. That's a hustler. That's a pimp. You feel what I'm saying? You know, so I think about all those definitions. You know, like if, how can I say all this stuff and then I'm going around, you know, trying to mack a whole bunch of women around the country like a lot of male speakers do. I know them. Y'all brought them to this stage. Y'all know that. Some of them have been here. And some of them are public intellectuals. And they, some of them have actually criticized Bill Cosby. I'm like, you saying you're doing the same stuff. And so, you know, all of that stuff, we got to reshape this. You know, we got to reshape it. You know what I'm saying? We got to reshape it. That's what I say. Do me a favor, Kevin. You was talking about reading. You see that rise above sign right there? Can you read, like, those little letters at the bottom of it, all the words? Is this an eye test? Nah, just read it for me. Just, just I wear context. Read just go ahead and read it for me. Read Race, it all. You mean those words? Racism, ignorance, sexism, ableism, stereotypes, homophobia, xenophobia, prejudice, injustice, discrimination. Bada! He's a trip. <laughs> Real quick, this is a gift to you, Kevin. You did an excellent job up here. Can we all give a hand for Kevin, please? You. you did a wonderful job. Please buy the book outside. I'll come and sign some copies of the book. This right here, and I want you to open it. This is a copy of the statue that Frederick Douglass. There's so many great things that have happened here. So many great things that can go. This is a gift from the university from us to you. Thank you. We thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. I'm gonna say this. Thank you. This is nice. Go ahead, go ahead. You said it's nice. It's nice. Thank you. It's very nice. It's free too. I need one too. But nonetheless, there's a lot of questions that still have to be asked. We appreciate you for coming up here. I look at like this. Kevin is a fruit. I am the juice, y'all are the seeds. And these seeds are gonna get planted to make more fruit. So what I will say is this. <laughs> Go with it for a second. <laughs> I wanna hear the rest of these questions. And he's single, y'all. <laughs> you still single? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm married myself now. Okay. No, but nonetheless, I wanna get through the rest of these questions. What I will say is I will offer both my line as well as my organizations Black Mill Initiative, we want to get the rest of these questions asked and answered. So please, if you have the opportunity, come to me after the show, ask me what these questions are. We thank you for your time, Mr. Captain Powell. Do you have anything else you'd like to let us know? I love y'all, thank y'all, and you know, fight the good fight for yourself or for other people as well. Do something to help other people the rest of your life, please. That's it. And thank now you. we are proceeding to our book signing segment. Thank you, bro. Right. We are you. proceeding thank to our now. book signing segment. Please go right over here. We thank you for joining us today. Y'all have a great evening, everybody.